ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا انه من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا whom so ever Allah guides the whole world cannot misguide this person and whom so ever Allah allows to be misguided then nobody nobody will bring this person back to guidance wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu wa safiyyuhu min khalqihi wa khaliluhu fa sallallahu alayhi salatan wa salaman yaliqani bi maqam sayyid al anbiya wa imam al mursalin my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran always reminds us to have taqwa of him to do our best to protect ourselves from anything that earns us the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ittaqu allaha wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghad. Wattaqu allah, inna allaha khabirun bima ta'amaloon. Believers, be conscious about Allah. And let every soul think and reflect what we prepared for tomorrow, for the afterlife, and be always conscious about Allah again, because Allah is aware of everything that you do. رَبِّ اشْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسْرِ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي In this short khutbah, I would like to have some reflections on our game plan, action plan, after Ramadan. So Alhamdulillah, we all lived a wonderful season of ibadah and worship in Ramadan. And I stress the fact that all of us lived this wonderful ibadah, even if you think little of yourself, even if you think you were not that religious. You definitely benefited from the month of Ramadan. And what we want to realize is that now, we, as we all know in the hadith, the devil was chained in Ramadan and now he's out or they are out, and we need some understanding how to maneuver this relationship with the devil being out. And we sometimes feel it like usually in every night of Eid or day of Eid, there's always a fight happening inside your house. Fight between you and your wife or husband, fight with the kids, some argument with our neighbors on something, some argument in the parking lot of the masjid as you're going to Salat al-Eid. There's always something, some of these, uh, you know, emotions raging out. It's definitely the shaitan who's trying to let us lose that spirituality after Ramadan. And to understand the game plan of the shaitan, I want us to study him. Not through some metaphysical way of studying the shaitan, how he looks like physically. But simply by referring to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kitab Allah. So the, uh, the, the plan that the shaitan has for me and you, it is actually laid out in the Quran. There's no hidden secrets. Part of the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <clears throat> that he doesn't tell you, be conscious of Allah and be righteous and that's it. There's always detailed step-by-step -step descriptions of what are the obstacles in your way towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll be reflecting on some ayat from Surah Al-A'raf, Chapter number 7, the ayat 20 and up or 15 and up, where Allah tells us the moment when the shaitan was kicked out of paradise. When he refused to make sujood to Adam. And he started blaming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي It is you, ya Allah, who caused me to be misguided. And when he asked Allah to delay his punishment. أَنظِرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ just delay my punishment. And Allah gave him that. Okay, you, you, you won't be cursed right now, or you are cursed right now, but your punishment is delayed until the day of judgment. And the shaitan's plan is to prove to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this person, Adam, and his offsprings, his children, the sons of Adam and the daughters of Adam, the human beings, you favored them upon me. You gave them the respect, they don't deserve it, Ya Allah. Let me show you. He knows that he, there's no way for him to get back to Jannah, but he wants to make sure he can drag as many people as he can 
to hellfire. There are people who know they're not going to succeed in their exams. They know they're failing. They know they're losers in life. The only comfort they get is by looking at others fail and fall down, subhanAllah. And this is a devilish trait of the shaitan. So he told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, قَالَ فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Ya Allah, because you misguided me. So one of the ways that you know you have a devilish trait inside you, if you start blaming others for your own mistakes, for your own misdeeds. It's my parents, they did not raise me well. It's the masjid, I don't like their khutbas. It is the, those Muslim people, they are so, too judgmental. It is those uh, friends, it is the influence, I have this, it is the internet. When you start blaming others, when you start justifying your own mistakes because of other people, guess what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran about a wife who lived in the most miserable places, the wife of Pharaoh. Her husband was not an abusive person alone. He was the Pharaoh. And she was a righteous person. She became one of the four righteous lead, uh, women of all time, Imra'at Pharaoh. And there's another wife who lived in the house of a prophet, the wife of Nuh. And she did not follow him. So don't blame the circumstances. I know you might go, be going through difficult times, but don't get this satanic trait of blaming others. Because that's what the shaitan did. He refused to do sajda to Adam. Then he started justifying the sin. So all of us sin. All of us commit mistakes. That's what makes us human. But when we start justifying our sins and mistakes, like the shaitan, I think I'm better than him because I'm created from fire. Then you have a devilish act or a devilish trait inside you and then this caused him to blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not only that, he started plotting against everyone that Allah has favored. So the shaitan is telling us, is telling Allah, that I'm going to be waiting for them in ambush. La is when somebody is sitting firmly waiting for you. He has the time. You think that the shaitan did not get you today so you're safe? No. He has the time. He's studying you. He's watching your behavior. Knowing what you like and what you hate. Knowing your personality. La lahum siratakal mustaqim. La is when he waits in ambush as we said like cops who might be hiding behind a bridge in the highway and when you overspeed, they get you. That's exactly what the shaitan is sitting and waiting for. And where did he say he's going to sit? In the bar? No. In the theater where it might be showing an R-rated movie or on Netflix when you are watching something impermissible? No. The shaitan will sit for me and you on as-sirat al-mustaqim, on the straight path. The shaitan won't wait for you in the bar on Michigan Avenue. He's going to wait for you here in this masjid until you're done with your salat or maybe during your salat and start whispering. Some people can say, I did not have these thoughts or feelings before I became more religious. This Ramadan, I was praying the five times. I was getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was improving. And then all of these spirituality is, is, is destroyed. That's because the shaitan is exactly here because he knows there's some progress. That's why one of, the, one of the most difficult steps you can take towards Allah is the first step. Baby steps that will improve your spirituality is one of the most difficult ones. Why? Because the shaitan knows it's going to drag and you'll become a better person. Like Ibn al-Qayyim says, if a house is empty, nobody will go and try to rob it and steal from it. Because that house, that house is empty. When you are not religious, the shaitan has no interest in seducing you. Once you have some spirituality, some knowledge, some good friends around you, something that makes you proud of yourself, the shaitan will go and start stealing from that house, which is your heart. Brothers, can you come to the front? Jazakumullah khair a little bit. Barakallah feekum. So, لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ سِرَاتَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ The more religious you are, the more tears are coming out of your eyes, out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more challenging it will be. Then the shaitan says a very profound statement. Again, he's telling us his game plan. 
And we all know I work in an automotive company. We always buy competitive companies' cars in a very legal way, and we benchmark them. We reverse engineer them. We understand everything, the engine, the torque, the RPM, performance, and VH, because we want to understand what our competition is doing. In basketball, no team can keep on winning the NBA forever. There are other teams that are studying every single step, that every offense, every defensive move, every player, so that they have plans to work against you and win over. And we've just seen what happened. So the shaitan, his plan, game plan is not a secret. It's given to us. He says, I will come to them from the front, head on, in front of them. وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ And I will attack them from behind, from the back. وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ I will attack them from all sides, from the front, from the back, from the right, from the left. And this may mean that Allah is telling us He's going to be all over you. But there's also a difference between attacking us from the front, from the back, from the right, from the left. There's no time to go over all the tafsir of this ayah. I will be sharing some glimpses of what does it mean when the shaitan attacks from the right versus the left from, versus the front. All of these are strategies from the shaitan. All of these are attacks that the shaitan can use. And we are different people here. What is seduction to me might be different than what's, what's seduction to you. So we should understand that the shaitan knows us and knows our personalities. So what is the game plan? How does the shaitan attack us from head on, from the front, for example? So usually, from the front refers to what's immediately in front of us, what's right there in our face. Human beings tend to be impulsive and tend to just want things that are right ahead of us. And we see this in shopping when we go to a mall or supermarket. Most of the people go shopping for eggs and milk. But they never, never put the eggs and milk in the front of the supermarket. They're always in the back. Because they want you to come across the chips and cakes and Swiss rolls and all the unhealthy stuff for you and alcohol, which for other people, so that you are always heading and putting stuff in your cart that you don't really need, that you, you did not intend to buy. And that's why they tell you you never shop when you're hungry. Because you'll always end up getting more stuff in, in your cart. The, the, the shaitan wants you to capitalize on that. The shaitan wants to always look for your need for instant gratification. Whatever you need right now. Without thinking of future consequences. And if you talk to any doctor, ER doctor. Talk to them about their experiences. Friday afternoon, Friday evening, Saturday morning. When people go there, most of them drunk. Most of them go in a very miserable place. And you ask, why are they doing this to themselves? Don't they know that alcohol is bad for them? Yes, of course, they know. But they don't want to think about consequences. They just want to enjoy the moment. It can't be that bad. Now, 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 nowadays, we live in the digital age. And companies, tech companies, talk about UX, user experience. People want stuff right now. At the push of a button, I want to hear the latest song. I want to get the latest show. I want to binge watch a Netflix, an episode after the next. I cannot wait. I want to order something, Amazon, two days at my front step. People cannot wait. People don't want to think about the credit card bill they have to pay at the end of the month. They just want things, want things right now. And when the shaitan attacks us from the front, he's usually focusing our attention on material things. What do I own? What do I have in my garage or in my car? What, do, what car do I drive? How do I look? How much do I weigh? Looking at ourselves in the mirror. It's always material things. It's never spiritual things. What's ahead of us also is meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should understand when the shaitan is attacking us from the front, he wants us to forget that one day we shall meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Death, we all know death is coming. But we don't want to think about it. So the shaitan wants to make sure that he's overwhelming us with desires, with things that may be halal or haram, so that we don't think about death. We don't think about the afterlife. It's like when I was driving to this masjid, there was a bus in front of me. 
And this bus was so big, I could not see the traffic. It was overwhelming me. It was blocking my view for what's ahead of me. And that's exactly what the shaitan is doing to me and you. He wants us to forget about the fact that we are meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shaitan wants to come to us from the front, meaning that usually as a human being, you're motivated by your goals. Each one of us has our goals, our aspirations, our dreams. I want to graduate. I want to get to a good school. I want to start my own business. I want to work in this company. And these are all good goals. But these are short-term goals. It's like you're, if you're climbing a mountain and you have this hook and you just throw it 20 feet or 10 feet ahead of you, you're only going to climb these 20 feet. You don't have high aspirations and goals. They say if you shoot for the stars, you'll land on the moon. But if you only shoot for a lower goal and you're not, you don't have short, long-term goals, you'll be always limited. So your goals, whether it's to get fit, to, bulk, to build some muscles, to become healthy, to lose weight, to attend a college, to get an education, all of these are worldly goals. The final destination is the Akhirah, meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the shaitan wants to attack me and you from the front and make us be, be distracted by worldly things. ثُمَّ لَا أَتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ From the front and from the back. وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ what, does the, what are the implications of the shaitan attacking us from the back? There's a lot of imagery, but one of them is our history, our past, our previous experiences. And technically, we are the sum of our previous experiences in life. <coughs> if, la samahallah, God forbids, if you run into an accident one day, you will start driving more carefully because this experience will haunt you. If you had a fight with another neighbor or a relative, you will be, will be, you'll watch out the next time you talk to them because that experience has hurt you. And our experiences, whether spiritual or emotional or our physical experiences, will always affect us. And the shaitan wants us to think that all of these bad thoughts are us. You are a bad person. You are a drug addict. You are a sinful person. You are a fornicator. You are a shameless person. And that's not true at all. Allah wants to raise us. Allah wants us to understand Adam. We are honored creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who may have slipped, who may have done some dark moments in our life, but that's not us. So the idea that shaitan will tell you, you are hopeless. Yes, you were good in Ramadan, but remember what you did before Ramadan. Remember that moment, remember that moment. So the shaitan coming to you from behind is trying to drag you back to your old, to your old life, that you will never be good, that you will never be a good person. Shaitan sometimes pulling you from behind can refer to bad experiences. So you interpret every bad experience. You lost a job, you lost a beloved member of the family, you know, you had moments of depression. You will think this is because Allah hates you. This is a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, this is another example of the shaitan pulling you from behind. In fact, we all know that the prophets are the most honored people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was one person I was talking to this week. That person, young person, in his early 20, 20s, lost his mom and dad. And he was forming this negative experience about life, that life is a punishment, that life is a horrible thing. I, I, I must have done something bad so that Allah is punishing me with this. Not at all. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, as we all know, lived while being an orphan. When he was a parent, he lost his child. He was tried with so many things. He buried his own wife with his own hands. And this actually raised him in ranks, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shaitan is there waiting to attack us from the front, from the back, وَعَنْ Let me reflect on one aspect of وَعَنْ Usually the right hand refers to good deeds. That's why if you are given your book in the afterlife with your right hand, this is, means, alhamdulillah, you're going to Jannah. The right hand is referring to the honor uh, that Allah is honoring you. 
How can the shaitan come to you from the right? From good deeds. I thought right hand is always associated with good deeds. Yes. You might have enjoyed some moments of spirituality in Ramadan. And alhamdulillah, you're raising and you're getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaitan can trick you and make you more arrogant. And you look down at others who are not as righteous as you. Oh my God, they're bad. Look at, mashallah, I memorized half the Quran. Look at me, mashallah, I'm growing a beard. Look at me, I look more religious than them. Look at me how righteous I am. I paid more sadaqah. And that's exactly what the shaitan wants. He could not stop you from doing the right deeds. Now he's trying to, 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 to make you more arrogant. Right deeds should make you more humble. Right deeds and good deeds should make you more you know, uh, you know, uh, careful about others. Right and good deeds should make you reflect and ask Allah, Ya Allah, please accept from me. Because I don't know. Maybe Allah did not accept my deed. When Ibrahim السلام, built the Kaaba, the most honored house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he was finishing the foundations of the Kaaba, his, old, his own dua was, رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Ya Allah, accept from us. So if in, if in this Ramadan, you felt more closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if this feeling is making you think that you have done enough, you're, you, you have figured it out, you're there, you're guided, then guess what? The shaitan has come to you from the right side, from your good deeds. Because good deeds should make you more humble to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shaitan told Allah, لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ from the front, so that I block their view from seeing reality of things. وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ and I pull them from behind. وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ And then the shaitan told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the conclusion of all of this, وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ You won't find them grateful. The, the criteria, the measure of success, how the shaitan will know that he has achieved his plan on me and you, we become ungrateful. We become pessimistic. We become hopeless. Nothing will come out of this world. You graduated from college, yeah, what, what's the point? I'm not going to find a job anyway. There are people who are expert complainers. They are very good at complaining. And they're very good at negativity. They are, they are contagious. They throw this complaining everywhere. And if they don't have anything to complain about, they say, pretty much nothing to complain about. You ask them, how are things? Pretty much, I'm surviving. How was the weekend? Not too bad. That's what always we hear in the corporate world. People always complaining and complaining and complaining. If you are complaining, if you're ungrateful, then the shaitan has in some way or another controlled me and you to stop seeing the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us and our family and our community a way to be protected from the shaitan. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم فاستغفروه فيا فوز المستغفرين. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Brothers and sisters, والله a very brotherly advice. We will not be safe from the shaitan until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This does not mean to be pessimistic, as I said, and sad and gloomy that there's no way out. Actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help me and you. Allah will facilitate our way, our sirat al-mustaqeem in this world. That's why one of the meanings of اهدنا الصراط المستقيم Ya Allah, guide us to the straight path and guide us on the straight path so that if the shaitan is seducing us, we are protected. And then Allah says صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم The sirat of those that earn your favor Ni'ma is a blessing from Allah but Ni'ma means also Ya Allah من النعومة Ya Allah, you facilitated their way. So the idea is the sirat al-mustaqeem will be made easy on me and you and we will be protected from the shaitan by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we have to understand that there's an enemy, that this enemy does not sleep. Hassan al-Basri was asked one time, does the shaitan sleep for a second? He said, no. He's always plotting. He's always waiting. But alhamdulillah, the will of Allah is stronger than the plans of the shaitan. And this Ramadan proved to us that we can, and inshallah will be always protected. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to save us and our community from the plots of the shaitan. Allahumma aghfir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabbit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. Allahumma anna na'udhu bika anna dhilla au nudal au nazilla au nuzal au nazlima au nudlam au najhala au yujhala alayna 
وصلي اللهم وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه